Hello and welcome everybody to today's webinar, Engaging Drivers on Key Safety Messages, sponsored by Mix Telematics. My name is Sarah Plum and I'm the Senior Fleet Officer, part of the Global Fleet Team here at BRIC, the Road Safety Charity, where we work with fleet operators and suppliers to share resources and best practice across the industry. You should all now be able to see my presentation and hear the audio alongside it. As attendees, you are all muted, so you don't need to worry about any background noise from your offices. All over the world, driver error and risk taking is a leading cause of road crashes. For many employees, driving is the riskiest activity they undertake at work. Whether you're operating a small fleet or running a global fleet of vehicles, providing an effective program of training and education for your drivers is one way you can help make our roads safer. This webinar, We'll explore some of the key methods and themes of driver education and we'll discuss the different methods you can use to inform and engage your drivers about road safety issues. Our speakers today are Jonathan Bates, Marketing Director at Mixed Telematics, who are kindly sponsoring this webinar, Colin Patterson, Head of Marketing and Keith Freeman, Fleet Training Manager at DriveTech, David Ward, Senior Technical Manager at Hariba Mira and Fernando Rodriguez, Head of Prevention and Road Safety at Fondacion Mapfre, Lisa Dawn, Associate Professor at Cranfield University, and Steve Havas, IMDS Project Manager at Anglian Water. All of today's presentations are pre-recorded, um, but we do have some of our presenters who will be joining us live later today to answer questions you may have. There are two ways to put forward your question to us. Firstly, there is a chat box on the webinar panel where you can send your question at any point during the webinar. Alternatively, there is a raise hand icon on the same panel and you can press this during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentations and we will unmute you. And you can put your question to the panel then directly over the phone. Before we start with the first presentation, I just want to take the opportunity to give you a very brief overview of Break, who we are and what we do. Set up and founded in 1995, Break's vision is quite simple, a world that has zero road deaths and injuries and a world where people can get around in ways that are safe, sustainable, fair and healthy. We promote road safety awareness, safe and sustainable road use and effective road safety policies through campaigns, community education and information and advice for organisations operating fleets of vehicles and road safety professionals. And of course, by running the UK's flagship road safety event, Road Safety Week, which takes place in November every year. We also provide essential support to people across the UK devastated by road death and serious injury to help them in their darkest hours. So in terms of support, we run a quality accredited free phone helpline in the UK for people bereaved and seriously injured in road crashes. You can see some information on the level of support we gave in 2017 on your screen now. In addition to the helpline, we also provide support literature and work very closely with police forces throughout the UK so that when someone does receive that knock on the door from a family liaison officer, they are providing them with best practice support literature. We campaign nationally and regionally to raise awareness among the public and to lobby government and push for change in road safety legislation. An example of this is our 2016 Roads to Justice campaign, which centred around getting justice for bereaved families. This UK campaign launched outside Parliament and gained a lot of media attention and I'm sure most of you will have seen the changes to criminal driving sentencing announced in October 2017. We also do a lot of campaigning more generally on raising awareness of a range of topics, some of which you can see on the screen now. Awareness raising and education in communities is delivered through projects such as our Beep Beep Days. Each year, Break helps hundreds of companies run road safety projects in their communities and inspire children to be safe on our roads. We have well-established events and resources to help you run activities locally to your business. Our community engagement team can help put you in touch with local schools and nurseries and give you advice on how to talk to different age groups. Or your company can work with Break to establish your very own community project. We have two main projects this year, our Beep Beep Days for two to seven year olds and Breaks Kids Walks for four to 11s. And details are on your screen. We can also con contact us for more information. We also share training tools and guidance on global fleet safety best practice through our Break Professional Membership Service. 
We provide our members with tools to manage occupational road risk, regardless of budget, fleet size or vehicle type. We run an annual calendar of events, including webinars such as today's and seminars and training throughout the year. We also have annual flagship events, such as our Fleet Safety Conference and Fleet Safety Awards. In addition to these events, we also produce a lot of resources for employers, including guidance reports on introducing policies and sharing best practice case studies. Alongside that, we provide employers with tools to use directly with their drivers. And you can see on screen now some of the posters, infographics and videos you can use to engage your own drivers. If you have any questions or would like to find out about how you can get more involved with this here at break, please do let us know. So on to today's webinar. The presentations today will last for approximately 70 minutes and as I referred to earlier, there will be plenty of time to ask any questions at the end should you have them. And without further ado, we'll start the first presentation now, so I'll hand you over to Jonathan at Mix Telematics. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to this webinar discussing how end-to-end -end solutions can be used as powerful risk reduction tools. My name is Jonathan Bates and I am the Marketing Director for Mixed Telematics Europe and North Africa and I'll be guiding you through these slides today. End-to-end -end safety solutions are multifaceted and require commitment and buy-in from multiple audiences within a company paired with the advisory expertise and implementation of appropriate safety technology solutions in order to be successful. And here's a short diagram that explains some of the key proponents involved in the programme. Each company culture and organisation structure can be different. Therefore, customisation and flexibility of solution plus the appropriate authoritative advice is needed for the purposes of this webinar, we're going to walk through a step-by-step -step best practice process for implementing a successful end-to-end -end safety solution. Now we begin with the driver because safety is all about the driver. They are the VIP that we need to recognize and respect in the process. So that's where we begin our journey today. When considering putting in place a program involving telematics, it really is vital to communicate effectively with all project stakeholders. And most of all, it's fundamental to explain the personal safety benefits to all drivers. A mature safety program's key goal should be to make sure that every driver goes home safely to their families. The safety change management project requires the deployment of many versatile elements. The driver should be provided with the appropriate in-cab safety device, which alerts in real time to manage driving behaviors. With the expertise of a telematics fleet consultant, the appropriate event thresholds are set. And when AMBER is activated, it's when an event is close to hitting a dangerous level, then an event is not recorded against that driver, which does give that driver a chance to correct the behavior. If it hits a dangerous threshold, the red LED is activated and an event is recorded. We'll explore more of this triumvirate of different roles involved in creating excellent driver performance as we move through the slides. Away from driving a vehicle, the driver should also be provided with an app that allows them to see in confidence the trends of their own safety behaviours. This is absolutely key in engaging drivers in the mentality of continuous improvement. The in-cab device itself is designed in such a way that it is not to distract the driver from driving because clearly the most important thing is the driver is focused on driving the vehicle. You can see here on this slide the benefit of bringing everything that I've just explained together in one place. You've got the technology and the apps but they're only useful if coupled with expertise and engagement and that's why we strongly recommend the employment of an expert fleet consultant to assist in imbuing this safety culture within an organization as and when a technology solution is deployed. The next important step is to give the right level of information to the supervisor, who is also then responsible for doing something with that information to improve the process. Looking at driving performance trends over time, supervisors can understand what is going on and also recommend tailored training for each driver as a result. 
This type of information cuts right to the chase and shows a supervisor exactly what needs to be done in order to optimise best practice within their drivers. If we take a detailed example, a RAG or red, amber, green score is calculated to help supervisors to quickly understand and interpret all of that data in an actionable manner. Thus, it's easy to understand which particular behaviours need to be focused on and then recommended to a driver trainer to help assist the driver to improve. Red drivers within this score require the most improvement. Amber drivers have room for improvement and green drivers are denoted as excellent. And of course, it's important to have that fleet consultancy expertise to set those thresholds at the right levels so that drivers appear in those different categorizations as is appropriate to their safety performance. This slide may look a little complex, but I only want to make one point on it. There's a clear correlation between driver engagement with the driver app that we just discussed previously and a reduction in safety related events. The graph at the top is showing the safety related events going down over time and the graph at the bottom, which is contemporaneous to the one at the top, is showing the engagement level of drivers. And that means the number of times that they're logging into the MyMix app to view their own performance. Thus, as they get more engaged in the program, their ability to drive down the occurrences of those events improves. We provide the tools to help manage um, that process so that the supervisor can see how many times each driver is logging into the app. Once areas for improvement focus have been defined, tailored training should be put in place. And that's the next step in order to get this culture of continuous improvement up and running. Using the same kind of trend information that's available, the positive impact of that training is also easy to assess. Therefore, the trend information should not just be used retrospectively, to see what's happened, but actually proactively in the future to understand how that training is actually impacting each driver. Many different types of training can be conducted and the suitable one should be selected by the company in keeping with the specificity of the individual company culture. Thus, one to one training might be appropriate in some companies, whereas perhaps in a large multinational organisation, e-learning with all the different language permutations may be the most appropriate type of training to front the project. It really is up to each company in consultation with the telematics fleet consultant who can make recommendations to then set the right level of training program. Building the habit of cultural excellence does not happen overnight. I can guarantee that from my experience. It is the result of a concerted organisational effort over time to edify and cultivate a safety driven ethos. This certainly requires top down buy in and drive. Ergo, the senior management team in a company needs concise, actionable intelligence in the form of straight to the point, no nonsense KPIs that are relevant to the functional area and role within the safety program that they're accountable for. The Mix Insight Agility dashboards that our consultants build are constructed bespoke to each key audience member in a company, thus giving them the key decision-making data that they need. To implement a truly elite safety program, other elements may be required from scratch or to be incorporated over time. And as we discussed at the start, it really is important in the requirements definition phase before a project commences to understand what level of technology and expertise is appropriate for the maturity and objectives of that organization at each moment in time. I strongly recommend that organisations look at at least a three year plan that looks at achievable things that they can manage year on year and potentially look to continuously improve by introducing the latest technologies and expertise over time. For example, connected camera safety solutions can protect a driver from the risk of fraudulent claims and they can also illuminate in detail the context of safety behaviours. The important thing with a connected camera solution is that you only really want to apply it here to the safety behaviours. So what we do is actually create specific events around those safety behaviours and the camera will only then send footage that's pertinent to when those safety events occur. We have different camera options in the marketplace and I would recommend that you consider the benefit of both a road and driver facing camera as well as the fact that you might want a scalable solution that has the option for additional cameras. 
By making the footage available together with all of the telematics data in the telematics SaaS platform, customers can understand more and more about what is happening to their drivers out on the roads and really drill down to the detail of why and how these different types of events are happening. Here's a brief example of some of the key benefits in action where video evidence can improve safety through adding value to a training program, as well as on top of that, reducing organizational risk exposure. And I think you can see from those statistics that customers that do take this solution are actually enjoying those dual benefits. Another area to consider in terms of enhanced features might be heat mapping analysis. Now, heat mapping analysis identifies high risk areas using some clever analytics. Effectively, it looks at the spread and severity of different types of safety behavior events in a geographical manner and then contextualizes that on a heat map. So this is a great way to visualize and understand where clusters of dangerous events occur and then potentially the customer can adjust routes or behaviors accordingly. Another service that is extremely popular in the marketplace and has been proven time and again to reduce risk is the application of electronic and vehicle safety checks. So vehicle safety checks can be conducted pre-shift in order to verify that a vehicle is safe to drive before a particular operative takes control of the vehicle. This can play a significant role in not only helping to meet duty of care ob obligation or compliance, but also they've been proven to reduce safety risks. So in conclusion, an end-to-end -end safety solution can take many forms and guises and can feature different elements. But the key is the following. It's absolutely vital to blend and marry the organizational buy-in, the full communication program throughout an organization, to really treat the driver like a VIP and engage properly with them and get that culture going through the company and also marry that together with suitable and proportional technology and expertise. Some of on screen now are some of the different additional elements that we haven't had time to talk about today. There are many different technological enablers to elite safety performance, but I think you hopefully have taken from my presentation that it's actually key to have the right strategy in place first and then select the right elements to correspond to that strategy. There's no silver bullet when it comes to improving road and driver safety. Thank you very much for listening today, and I hope that the presentation was useful to all of you. Thank you very much for that, Jonathan. Much appreciated. And we'll now go on to Colin Patterson and Keith Freeman at Drive Tech. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're two colleagues, I'll introduce us in a second, from Drive Tech, a driver training company. Uh, our brief today is to talk around three key facets of drivers as we come across them in our training, and that is to look at their attitude, their behavior, and their competence. Very briefly introducing us, you'll hear mostly from Keith Freeman, our fleet training manager, and I am Colin Patterson, I'm the head of marketing. Just to give you a quick overview of Drive Tech, in case you haven't heard of us, we're part of the AA in the UK, and we're a leading full service driver risk management business. We offer a range of fleet services, which include fleet risk audit, driver license checking, driver assessments, e-learning, training workshops, on-road coaching, and of course, management information and reporting to help improve. We have three main businesses. One is we deliver police speed awareness or driver aware training courses on behalf of the police. We have a UK fleet business, and we also have an international fleet business. And you can find out more, as always, on our website at drivetech.co.uk. Now I'd like to hand over to Keith. Thank you, Colin. Um, first of all, thinking about the attitude, behavior, and competence of a driver, they're all intertwined. Um, we learn driver competence from um, being a learner driver, and then we develop into quite a rich tapestry of different types of drivers. We can become distracted, we can become the racing driver, um, we can become the angry driver, driving fatigued, um, even the nervous driver. And we've got to quickly assess um, the, the training needs for each of these types of uh, driver. And firstly, thinking about competence and uh, 
relating that to something that somebody does every day, you may get the um, the person that plays football. They may be a professional footballer that I'm strongly advised in the top left-hand corner is um, somebody called uh, Lionel Messi. And then you've got a park footballer down in the other slide. And what we recognize with drivers is that they all come with a different level of competency. And whilst the driver, uh, whilst the footballer that plays park football would dearly love to play for um, a top level football team, we don't all come with the same level of ability. So part of our training skills are to, to drive, bring a driver's competency up as far as we possibly can. But recognizing that not all uh, drivers will reach the, those dizzy levels. But what we can do is we can all drive with um, a good attitude and behavior because attitude, attitude and behavior is something that we would expect from both of those levels of footballers, although we never wouldn't necessarily expect the same level of competence. And talking of which, Keith, that brings us on to the first of our coverage areas, competence. Yeah, well, that varies again uh, through my age. Um, you know, unfortunately, I'm moving into the age group where statistically I can be at a higher risk than I was 20 years ago. So using my own example, I've got to maintain my level of competency to the best I can. But most importantly, it's my attitude and behavior to driving that is really going to keep me safe um, and just high, the highest level of competency possible. Um, the competency scale here is that when we take a driver for driver training, um, they all think that they're probably better than they are. Um, obviously, we've got to assess where they begin, but if you ask a driver to assess their own driving skill, on a scale of one to 10, they will all put themselves near to the better end of 10 by saying they're a six, seven or eight, which of course all falls in the above average driver um, ability group. But then as they go through driver training, that they realize that they are becoming consciously competent through not realizing that there is something to learn. And that is the, most important part from a trainer point of view is to move them through from the, the first to the second phase there and then you've immediately got their engagement in, their, in any driver training course. And then we leave them at the final stage unconsciously competent. They've now got the right skills, attitude and behavior um, which are become, becoming ingrained for their own ongoing benefit. But the most important thing there is to actually leave them with a self-development plan um, so that they don't drop off the cliff again and fall back into where they were in the unconsciously competent stage. So giving them actually tools where they can measure their own ability is key. So Keith, give us an example. When you say self-analysis or self-grading, uh, what, what is an example of that? Okay, you take a driver that quite a common practice is to follow too close to the vehicle in front and the driver thinks that it's their own skill is to actually have a fast reaction brake heavily to avoid probably a rear end collision and they see that actually as a skill in their driving but actually to get in them to develop their following distances to the point where if they find that they brake late or harshly that instead of blaming the other person that probably didn't signal early enough and left their braking too late. They look inwardly to self-develop that that was a braking event that could, be, could have been avoided. Okay, I've got it. Okay, thank you. Behavior is um, often based on um, past behavior. We, we learn what works for us um, and then we see that as the norm in our driving behavior. And an example of that is um, if you're find that you tailgate a driver in lane three that's traveling at the motorway speed limit, um, that um, with a little aggression through close following, it will make them move out of the way. They'll move over for you. But then occasionally you will come across the driver that will retaliate to that type of behavior and say, well, I'm deliberately not going to actually move out of that way. And you then find that that driver will escalate that situation 
and his aggressive, aggressive behavior will become more dangerous by actually starting to flash lights, probably undertake if the opportunity is there. But the aggressive driver will find more and more aggressive um, behaviors to actually make that work for them. So it's almost, it's a bit like the equivalent of on-road bullying, I suppose. Absolutely, yeah, that a driver will, can become a bully, you know, yeah, and where out normally out of the car, maybe they may not be that bully. So our trainer's role is to motivate the driver that they can appreciate that um, they can make the same progress um, without tailgating, without doing unsafe maneuvers. They can drive within legal limits. Um, no compromise to their own driving license there. And they become uh, responsible and considerate drivers. Fantastic. Okay, let's move to the, uh, of the three ABC. We're gonna move to the A. And that's attitude, Keith. Tell us a bit about that. Okay, it's, it's very important that the, we are aware of our own personal characteristics. Again, we make up a rich tapestry in the way we think about things, the way we deal with things. So um, analyzing our own personal characteristics um, and coping with those. You know, many drivers um, have a bit fixed and negative view to other road users. You know, quite often I will be in a training environment where um, a, a driver will say, I really don't like cyclist behavior. They don't uh, comply with any legal um, requirements, traffic lights or so on. Motorcyclists just filter between the vehicle. Instead of actually taking their, uh, taking their own personal responsibility for these people and accepting that they've got to share the roads. And if I look for these people, if I'm aware of these, then I can not only keep myself safe, but I can contribute towards their safety as well. Okay. Keith, can I just ask, um, in the UK this week, in fact, we've just announced a change to the uh, driving license test and uh, learners are now allowed to actually go on the motorways. Um, I guess that different people on road will have different attitudes to seeing a learner driver. But what's your thoughts on that? Oh, well, you've, you've thrown that one in, uh, Colin. Yeah, that's quite topical, isn't it, today? Absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and of course, at Drive Tech, that's something that we really do support. This is going to um, hopefully fast track um, a new driver's skill level um, and uh, by probably one or two years. Certainly many miles of driving on a motorway anyway. And again, thinking about us as the the company car driver and the more experienced drivers, that's gonna be part of um, our challenge now to look at that driver and say they may, even though they're going to be at or near driver test standard, they're under the guidance of a driving instructor, but they can still make that uh, maneuver that we may not anticipate. So again, let as more experienced drivers, instead of looking at them as a nuisance or they shouldn't be there, but actually say, this is all part of making the road safer, and I can contribute by, to that by taking some responsibility to what their actions may be. I get it. And yeah. a more open, share the road type attitude. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, it, it is important to make a conscious decision to treat other road users uh, differently, and actually control your own emotions and moods. We all, we are all um, influenced by um, work pressures, home pressures, whatever they may be. It's not always possible to get a good night's sleep, particularly if you take um, a young parent with a, a baby that's up all night. But actually, knowing what your own personal ability is and your coping strategies, it's, for example, I can probably be far more considerate to other road users if I'm not tired. I feel fresh, you know, if I'm not driving hungry, if I'm driving and I feel really hungry, I think we all know that any environment you tend to get a little bit more irritable if uh, you're trying to cope with something and you're feeling hungry. So actually making sure all this lifestyle is um, under control, um, then this is absolutely essential to safety. Fantastic. Okay. And our last slide, um, is really quick a summary, a, a quick summary of what we've covered. And those of you who have been paying attention will notice we haven't necessarily gone in sequence A, B, C, we went C, B, A. Um, why, does that matter, Keith? Not really. Um, it could be B, A, C. You can, because 
all of these overlap with each other. Um, so you could get a perfectly competent driver who has a poor attitude, you know, um, it could be vice versa, you know, a good attitude or behavior driver that's very nervous about driving and doesn't have confidence. So um, ABC fits in very conveniently, but they all intertwine with each other. Fantastic. So a useful mnemonic, if nothing else. Absolutely. Just yes. Yeah. Okay. Just, you'll be delighted to hear, we're now going to just summarize, I think, our experience and certainly Keith as a, a very experienced driver trainer is like all personal development, the best approach is a combination, a healthy mix of all sorts. So in terms of our experience at Drive Tech, we think that uh, interventions, regular refreshers, uh, combinations of face-to-face -face and distance remote learning help and sometimes provide practicality. Uh, regular assessments for drivers, in-car coaching is a real help, especially if you have somebody you identify maybe needs to change their attitude somewhat. E-learning modules are very useful, and of course, critical to anything is feedback to make sure that people know how they can be perceived and how they might improve. So thank you for that whistle-stop tour of ABC. Thank you to Keith, and uh, thank you very much to the audience for your engagement. So good afternoon, my name is Dr. David Ward from Hariba Myra, where I'm Senior Technical Manager for Functional Safety, and I'd like to talk to you today about driverless vehicles, are we nearly there yet? Specifically, the implications of autonomous technology on driver behavior and driver training. In my presentation, I'd like to cover the following subjects. First of all, I'd like to explain briefly what we mean by automation. Secondly, to recap on, on the approach to safety in the automotive industry and, and the journey that we are on safety wise. Thirdly, to talk about some of the implications for driver training and driver behaviour. And finally, to summarise with some conclusions and, and outlook. So the first topic is to explain exactly what we mean by automation. There are many different terms that people use um, in context of, of automated vehicles, terms such as autonomous, highly automated, self-driving cars, connected and autonomous vehicles and, and so on. So on this slide, I'm showing some examples of automated features or automated vehicles that, that people may be aware of or, or familiar with. On the top left, I'm showing uh, an example of the type of feature in vehicles that many of us will be becoming familiar with. This is automatic emergency braking, where the vehicle is able to measure the distance to a vehicle in front. And if the closing distance and closing speed uh, becomes too close, then the vehicle is able to warn the driver and also to apply the brakes to, to intervene to either help prevent a collision or to mitigate the, the closing speed. For many people, the vision of automated vehicles is, is what we're showing in, in the bottom left, a vehicle that's able to make a, an arbitrary journey completely under automation without um, human driver intervention. We also need to be aware there are other more specific applications of autonomy. Top right, we're showing a, a different type of vehicle that's being trialled at low speed in, in urban settings. And also, we shouldn't discount bottom right new modes of transport, such as uh, the PRT system at Heathrow, which we're showing here. And one of the interesting questions that was faced when, when that system was initially being designed is, is whether that's a, in fact a car or, or a train and which safety principles should, should apply. So there are many different examples of automated vehicles, many different uh, words in, in circulation. What I'd like to do briefly is, is just to give the technical definitions that, that we use in, in the automotive industry. And these are, are defined in, in a document called SAA J3061. And this document specifically avoids terms such as autonomous and, and self-driving, preferring instead to talk about levels of automation and to talk about the allocation of responsibilities for the driving between the, the electronic systems and, and the human driver. So a system with no automation, level zero, is, is one that simply gives information to the driver. So a feature such as lane departure warning is, is an example of that. A system that can provide support in one direction of motion, 
for example, controlling the steering only is, is a level one system. Lane keep assist is, is an example of this. And the expectation is that the human driver is, is in full time, full time control. This system is providing support to the driving task. Level two systems are where the system can control both the lateral and longitudinal motion of, of the vehicle. An example of that will be something like a traffic jam assistant, which is able to drive the vehicle at, at low speeds in, in queuing traffic, but with the expectation that the driver is, is fully in the loop and uh, monitoring situations that the automated system does not address. When we move on to level three, um, this is a level that's called conditional automation. This is where the system is able to, to drive the vehicle completely automatically un under limited circumstances, but with the expectation that a human driver will take over when, when signaled to. An example of this is, is highway chauffeur. Some manufacturers are bringing this to the market now where a vehicle is capable of being driven automatically for, for an extended period of time on, on the motor. Way. Level four and level five represent fully automated vehicles. The difference between level four and level five is, is that typically level four vehicles will drive automatically within uh, a defined context. So that might, for example, be an automated valet parking system or the use of uh, an automated ride sharing platform that's geofenced to only operate in, in a defined area. And then level five, of course, is the vision of, of the so-called Google car, where the vehicle is able to, to drive completely automatically end-to-end um, -end in, in an arbitrary journey. So I think it's important to note that when, when we're discussing these technologies in the automotive industry, we prefer to talk about levels of, of automation rather than, than using some of these terms which can be quite ambiguous in different contexts. I'd like now to move on to consider how the um, understanding and approaches to, to safety in the automotive industry has, has developed. The, the approaches and understanding of safety in the automotive industry started with what we now call passive safety. This is technology such as airbags and, and the physical design of vehicles that are designed to reduce the severity of an incident one, once it has occurred. We then moved on to consider active safety systems. This includes, for example, automatic emergency braking and, and stability control. These are designed to help prevent a critical situation that will be difficult for a driver to control from becoming, from becoming an incident. But we've now moved on um, in addition to consider what I describe as tactical safety systems. These are systems that assist the driver such that critical systems critical situations are avoided in, in the first place. Anything from systems that detect driver fatigue or, or inattention through to some of the highly automated features that, that I've, I've been describing. Uh, one of the important factors related to this is, is clearly this is driving a significant and continued growth in, in the electronics content of, of vehicles. When we come to consider how we, we design vehicles from a safety perspective, one of, the, one of the factors that we have to consider is that the driver is, is part of the control loop in, in vehicle systems, but receives very little specific training in, in operating uh, advanced systems in, in vehicles. What we find is, is that the driver forms a mental model of the way that the vehicle they are driving is responding to their control inputs and the influence on the driver's perception, particularly if there's a malfunction in, in the system, uh, is an important safety consideration. So a lot of the effort that we put into designing electronic systems in, in vehicles uh, is around detecting and, and preventing and mitigating the, the effects of malfunction in electronic systems and, and the software within them. But a key assumption in the way that we approach design of these systems in vehicles at the moment includes assuming that the driver is, is present and, and, has, and has final control and that if an electronic system experiences a malfunction, it can be switched off and can revert to manual control using other systems and or mechanical backups. The technical term that we use for that is fail silent behavior. So against that background of the types of technologies that we're, we're deploying in vehicles, what are the implications for driver behavior and, and driver training? First of all, in considering some of the, the driver behavior issues, we have to consider what I first of all called normal behavior. 
And one important factor we have to take into consideration is, is that normal, in quotation marks, driver behavior may be different from the assumptions and experience of engineers who develop the system. So it's very important to, to have input from people who are experts on, on driver behavior and, and the wide range of driver skills that we experience, such that we design systems to take account of um, a wide range of driver skills and abilities. But we also have to consider some, some more interesting situations and, and perhaps one of the, the best examples of this is a topic that we call reasonably foreseeable misuse. It's basically saying how far in the design of systems do we have to go predicting things that, that drivers may do that are reasonable or, or otherwise. Um, and the, the picture I'm showing here is, is an example of very bad behaviour which we, we certainly actively discourage in, in the automotive industry. This is an image of a vehicle equipped with a lane keep assist system. When we're designing systems like this, often vehicle manufacturers will put many disclaimers in the handbook saying that systems like this are not to be used for hands-free driving, but inevitably what happens is, is drivers try it. So we have to design in a system that's designed to detect whether the driver is still holding the hand wheel and to disable or discourage use of the system uh, if, if the driver is, is trying to behave in that way. What it was then found in, in one particular vehicle is, is that a, a driver could, could attach an object to, to the steering wheel, uh, which, which could then trick the system in, into thinking that the driver was still holding the wheel. So then we have to consider maybe a different type of sensing system to, to discourage that behavior. But one of the key questions that we have to, uh, have to consider is, is how far do we go in the de technical design of systems? And usually the assumption is that a driver is, is licensed for the type of vehicle they're driving, is driving with due care and attention, and is in, in a fit state to, to drive the vehicle. So it's clear that driver education about the capabilities of these systems, what they should and should not be used for, is, is very important. Secondly, we have to consider how people react to failures or perceive failures in a system, and this will become um, very important, to, even more important as, as we move towards some of the high levels of automation, particularly where there, there is handover between the, the system driving the vehicle and, and the human driver. And finally, I believe we also need to question whether long-standing assumptions about driver ability to respond to failure using mechanical backup are still valid. Uh, there's legal requirements about minimum levels of braking and steering performance that have to be provided through mechanical backups, but we have to evaluate whether drivers are, are still able to, to react in, in the expected ways to, to such failures, particularly in the context of highly automated systems. Another important factor that we have to consider is, is the way that drivers modify their, their behavior when we provide them with, with high levels of automation. We have to consider, for example, where the drivers maintain attentiveness in, in the presence of, of automation. Generally speaking, if, if drivers feel that a system like this is, is giving them support, then, then they will become less attentive, even if they are intended to be, be monitoring it. We also have to uh, educate and manage driver expectations of, of the purpose, capability and maturity of, of many of these systems, what, what the systems are, are intended to be used for, what they are not intended to be used for. And we have to couple that with, with well-documented phenomena in, in human behavior, such as risk compensation and, and de-skilling, where, where on, on the one hand, perhaps um, drivers feel that systems in, in vehicles um, allow them to take risks that really they should not do. So again, there's an important education factor there. We also have to consider de-skilling. So if drivers become used to automation or levels of, of comfort, what happens if, if those features are removed or, or they move to a vehicle where, where those features are no long, longer present? And a um, good example of de-skilling is, is the braking issue. I, I referred to um, drivers now are so used to vehicles vehicles with, with power assisted brakes that, that many drivers may, may panic when, when faced with, with a hard brake pedal if there's a failure, even though the, the brakes are still working and, and within um, minimum legal requirements. The final topic is, is that there's a group of interesting ethical and, and legal questions around the deployment of, of automated systems. 
thinking about some of the ethical questions we've come across for example researchers debating whether a highly automated function may have to choose between the lesser of, of two evils if, if a vehicle is, is found in a critical situation with a with an outcome that, that could lead potentially to, to different incidents that the the system may have to choose between personally i feel that's completely the wrong question that's completely ignoring the the point of tactical safety that i i referred to at the start of by presentation where the whole objective of, of deploying these systems into vehicles is to help prevent the vehicles getting in, into a critical situation never mind a, an incident incident occurring another uh, group of questions is, is around the, the liability and legal issues so for example who's responsible if, if a highly automated vehicle is, is involved in, in an incident um, I'm a, an engineer, not a lawyer, but I'm given to understand that in um, under some legal systems at the moment, even if the vehicle is, is completely automated, the person that is sitting in the vehicle is still deemed to be in control of that vehicle. Therefore, they must still be in, in a fit condition to, to drive it. And we have to ask whether some of these legal issues will, will change depending on the level of, of, of automation uh, that, that's applied. I think another potentially contentious issue is, is the way that um, highly automated vehicles implement traffic rules. And certainly I, I recently had the experience of, of being in a demonstrator vehicle where, where it stopped at, at a junction and the, the vehicle was, was taking its time to evaluate the, the scene around the vehicle, deciding whether it was safe to move off. And, and meanwhile, drivers in, in vehicles behind in the queue were becoming agitated and starting to, to sound horns and so on. So we have to think very carefully about how to make sure that these systems um, are safer than, than the humans that they're replacing, but that they don't also create safety situations by, by the way that they, they interact with, with other traffic. So finally, to, to conclude, in my presentation, I hope that I've demonstrated that highly automated vehicles and highly automated features in vehicles are, are a reality, and these will grow in market penetration and acceptance. What we're finding is, is many vehicle manufacturers in introducing these features to, to enhance the level of safety in their vehicles. We're also seeing legal pressures. For example, there's a new European Commission ruling that within three years, um, a whole raft of many of these safety features will have to be, be installed uh, as standard fit in, in new models of, of vehicles. However, as we've seen, deployment of these features raises new challenges and, and questions about the driver interaction with, with these systems, driver behaviours and expectation, and, and indeed whether particular training is given to drivers of vehicles in operating these systems. My final point is to say really we're all in this together. It's an issue that, that governments, that vehicle manufacturers, that, that professional driving associations, safety charities, etc. We really all need to, to work on this together so that we can deploy these systems and, and enhance the, the levels of safety uh, that are experienced on our roads. Brilliant, thank you very much for that, David. Um, I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions um, regarding that specific presentation later on. So we will now be going on to Fernando's presentation from Fondacion, Max. Good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here today with all of you. I would like to give you a brief presentation about a project and offering to you unselfishly and completely free of charge. It has a single and simple up purpose to enjoy you and your work colleagues a higher level of security, respect on road safety, and a better quality of life regarding your well-being and personal health. It is a project called to Empresa, your company, which its objective is to provide companies completely free of charge with implementation of road safety and healthy campaigns in this workplace. But first of all, let me give you an idea about the entity I represent at the seven. Fundación MAFRE is a non-profit organization created in 1975 by MAFRE Group that develops activities of general interest in Spain and 29 other countries, contributing to social welfare by fulfilling five purposes, including to promote the safety of people and their habitats with focus on road safety. To achieve our goals, we organize a wide range of activities worldwide, focusing in five key areas, social action, culture, health promotion, prevention and road safety, and insurance and social protection. 
and our activities address four target risk groups, children, young people, adult, and senior citizens. According to the World Health Organization, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It is not just an abstain of disease or disability. Following this definition, our goal is to improve people's health and safety in their life, not just only physical, but also mentally. And it includes the workplace too. To do so, we promote healthy eating habits, physical exercise, as well as preventing accident and disease, which are, which are related to people's lifestyle habits. And you may wonder what is important for companies to look after not just only the physical, but also the mentally well-being of their workers. In this respect, it's illogical to think that people who benefit from a good physical and emotional well-being will be more motivated and committed to their work and to their company, and will therefore contribute to creating a good work climate within the organization. In terms of road safety, what benefit do the employees agree? The first and most important is a reduction in the risk of accident and injuries, especially serious injuries. This translates into a better attitude and commitment to their work and to their company, as no one likes to work in a dangerous firm. And what are the benefits to the company? With road safety prevention at work, the firm reaps benefits such as fever working hour loss, but also an increase in road safety outside work. Approximately 30% of serious uh, crashes occur on work-related journeys, including committing, and it one in seven employees are affected by a work-related road accident at some point during their working lives. Facing these figures, we thought it's necessary to raise companies' awareness of the need to prevent occupational risk and improve road safety for their workers. We first started to work on road safety alongside the European Transport Safety Council 10 years ago, implementing it through the web portal seguridadvialenlampresa.com. This web portal, Fundación Mafre, provides company with a training program that includes a total of 13 free online courses on road safety, on road safety organized into three categories. Com common factors comprising four general courses that can be taken by any employee, professionals with eight different courses, uh, for example, those side that commercial drivers or drivers or good or construction material and one course of legislation. Depending on the need of each company, its management can select the most appropriate courses for their employees to take. And all the information related to road safety, such as new items, videos, seminars, example of good practice and so on, can be found in our website to keep prevention specialists, company manage, managers, and employees up to date with any relevant development. All of the courses include an assessment examination and upon day completion, the work is duly presented with a final certificate. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, we added the health component to the road safety part. That was how we created the Tu Empresa portal, and this is the image that we have in place in Mexico. The portal, cited between the partner company and Fundación Mafra, is customized with the logo and corporate colors of the company, encouraging the firm and its workers to identify with the platform. The portal is hosted on the internet of the partner company, and if the company doesn't have one, we offer to host it in our service, and we resend to the Human Resources Department with an URL link to resend to all of their employees. Within the platform, the company with which we are partnering with will have their own space to spread the word about activities, new items, or campaigns, for example, non smoking day, relating to health and road safety being on behalf of their employees. We will do the same, contributing with contents prepared by renowned professionals and body, which will be aligned with the contents. Uh, Published by the company we are partnering with. This is where the program's only requirements apply, being that each company must take responsibility for their own contents. There are examples of infographics from the portal. We provide companies 
with a limited amount of promotional materials along with the final artwork in case they need more. There are different material, for example, posters and accessories for vehicles, plate mats, um, leaflets, flyers. We also prepare activities for families to do together. One example of this kind of activities is our Fire Prevention Week. Fire Prevention Week is an awareness raising program that time to spread cell protection knowledge, conveying the main prevention guidelines to prevent fires and if they happen, how to reduce their consequences. Today, this activity is also carried out in several countries in Latin America in collaboration with different Latin American administration and with the support of the organization of firefighters, of which Fundación Mafra is a member. We have completed this activity with an installation so called power prevention. It has been designed with the collaboration of the Professional Firefighters Association and the College of Industrial Engineers of Madrid. The installation consists in two elements evacuation house and children's driver circuit. Evacuation house is an inflatable structure with a surface area of 150 square meters. The interior is filled with chemical smoke with allows emergency services to teach kids rules for prevention, consultancy, and for practicing evacuation in case of fire. On the old side, there are three different areas, one for giving cardiopulmonary resuscitation and first aid training session for which there are practice dolls, another for basic training on the use of child resistance system, and a third one for providing guidelines for using bicycles safely. Children's driver circuit is targeted at children from 3 to 12 years old who learn about traffic education using bicycle and as pedestrian, organized in group of between 8 to 10 children. Finally, one example to improve people's health and safety quality of life is the Vivir and Salud project, one educational activity in which, by means of a theatrical presentation, children learn in a fun way, healthy habits and to take a proper rest. Thank you so much for your attention. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Fernando. Right, we'll now go to Lisa Dawn from Cranfield University. Hello, everybody. I'd like to talk to you today about monitoring the effectiveness of driver training programs. If we think about it, when it comes to the discipline of, of medicines, it's very important that these are rigorously tested and they are done so against a control group that don't receive any medication or receive another type of medication, and even in some cases a placebo condition in which they think they're receiving some medication, but actually they're not. This is just the same for driver training programs because the same level of rigor is needed because there are life or death consequences. What are some of the evaluation problems that can occur and, and the reasons for this? Well, in fact, if you look at some of the research on evaluating driver behavior interventions, then some of the problems that have been encountered, including quite perverse reactions to driver training programs. So, for example, several studies have shown that when you introduce skid training, interventions where you're asking drivers to be able to control a skid and get into one and control it then that can actually increase the number of crashes that drivers have when driving in slippery conditions and in fact what pre uh, subsequent research have shown is that if you uh, actually phrase the training differently so that you're asking drivers to avoid getting into a skid in the first place you do have an impact on crash involvement so the way in which the training is structured is very important and it's, it's also clearly very important to evaluate your intervention because you don't know whether or not it's being effective in fact in some cases it could even be doing some harm so from a fleet perspective it's important to evaluate your driver training intervention because it guides your fleet safety initiatives and what improvements you need to be made need to make it also guides your company policy decisions and it helps you to invest in 
the future for your uh, fleet safety. So there are very important decisions to be made from a fleet perspective and a very good rationale for why you would need to evaluate driver training programs. Just like to um, generate some thoughts amongst those of you listening around um, some of the exercises that you can think about when it comes to uh, implementing a driver training evaluation. Take the example of the typical kind of driver training programs that are implemented within a fleet based company all the time. So the company's implemented a skills based driver training course for its fleet drivers. A driver trainer has conducted an assessment drive before the training and then the driver trainer delivers a two hour in car driver training course and then the same trainer conducts another assessment drive after the training. What the evaluation shows is that the fleet driver improves post training comparing assessment before and after. And the question is, is there anything wrong with that evaluation? Well, yes, there are a couple of things wrong. One is that the way in which the driver is being assessed is quite subjective. It could be that some of the driver trainers score differently. So has the assessment been standardized? Secondly, the trainer, um, that's a, a subjective opinion. Um, but also the main thing is that there is no control group here. So you're not comparing this intervention against a group of drivers that have not actually done any driver training. So they just had an assessment drive without the intervention at all. And that would be a much more robust evaluation. Another type of example would be a company that delivers a new driver training course to all its, all its fleet drivers from January to December in 2015. And then the fleet manager monitors crashes after the uh, intervention and finds that actually there is a reduction in crashes and concludes that this means that the driver training course was effective. Again, is there anything wrong with this evaluation? Well, yes, there is, because we don't know whether the crash rates within the company were going down anyway due to other reasons. So, for example, have they recently procured better vehicles? Has there been some changes to the road designs locally so that um, drivers are safer when they're out on the road? Has there been changes to, to the weather? Has it been a bad year for the weather? Or perhaps the, the task, the work task itself has also changed. Perhaps, you know, they're not so busy or have different routes. So there's a number of things that could have actually changed that have not been due to the intervention. So the only way that you're really going to get a robust uh, measure of whether or not the training course has been effective is if you randomly allocate your fleet to those drivers that uh, complete the intervention and those that don't and then compare their crash rates after that intervention. So that brings me on to the idea of the gold standard which is that we should be conducting randomized control trials within driver education so that we can actually make sure that we understand the benefit of the interventions that we put in place. And that means that we need to randomly allocate drivers to particular types of interventions. We need a control group so that we can compare the different groups against that intervention and then we can monitor its effectiveness against important criteria. So therefore, a control group is an essential part of your research design as it allows you to minimize the effect of all variables except the independent variable, i.e. driver education program, driver training, whatever kind of intervention you've put in place. In that kind of rigorous design, you've got a control group that receives no intervention, and that group is used as a baseline against which you can compare all other groups. 
The reason this is important is because there may be extraneous factors that can influence the outcome of your study. And by having a control group, you can actually look at the real effects of your intervention. And of course, it also gives you an indication of the magnitude of the effect. You'll also be able to see by how much your intervention has had an impact. An example of a randomized control trial, which was conducted over 22 years ago now, uh, was that published by Gregerson et al. in 1996. And it was a study in Sweden in which there were four interventions, a driver training group where a skills-based intervention was, was put in place, uh, a bonus group where drivers received a bonus for driving safely. This was against the whole group rather than individually. So the whole group had to behave well and safely in order to get the bonus. And then there was the campaign group where leaflets and, and talks were given to, to the group as a whole. And then there was a group discussion in which small groups were allocated to group facilitators to discuss problems within the company and uh, look at ways in which they could solve them and some of the issues that they had. And then there was a control group that, that actually had no intervention whatsoever. And there were about 900 participants per group. But importantly, they were allocated randomly. So it's not that, uh, let's say, the whole of the sales team were allocated to one group versus the whole of the admin team were allocated to another group. The reason being is that that's introducing a systematic error because it could be that salespeople are very different in their driving styles to people who are more office and clerical in, in, in nature of the work that they do. So the next stage was to make sure that the company had retrospective and post, post prospective crash data. So there was a baseline established a year before the intervention took place. And then, of course, a year after the intervention took place. And what the results showed was that there was actually a reduction in the number of crashes for all groups except the campaign and control group. But some of the groups had a much more positive impact than others. The risk ratio was calculated as the number of accidents per 10,000 kilometers. And uh, what was found was that the discussion group led to a 2.26 times less likelihood of being involved in a crash than having the control group, than, than the control group who received nothing. So that's a very positive finding. There was a benefit of driver training, but it wasn't as strong as the discussion group. And also when you looked at the crash claims costs, um, there was a, a much more beneficial uh, effectiveness of the group discussion compared to the driver training group. So that's an example of a randomized control trial that would be a very robust and rigorous method to evaluate your driver education program. When it comes to designing your own program, think about what aspect of behavior you think may have changed or that you want to change during the program. And that will determine how you go about your research, the kind of methodology you use, the kind of data collection processes. For example, do you want to try and encourage your drivers to use the mobile phone less? Well, in which case, you know, how are you going to go about that? How are you going to measure that? How are you going to monitor it? And uh, these are the sorts of things that drive your research questions. So interventions may involve a combination of techniques. It doesn't necessarily mean that you just have in-car training. Sometimes companies have lots of different elements within their fleet risk management programs, which can include driver training, driver coaching, behavioral workshops, telematics, feedback. And so you actually might need different types of evaluations or a different number of groups to find the optimal combination as it could be that certain elements of it are more beneficial than others. So when you're designing an evaluation, 
decide what your evaluation study period is going to be. Think about the long-term effects, not just the immediate benefits, because often behavior drifts back to an earlier form when it's not being monitored. So looking for long-term effects um, is actually a very useful way of thinking about fleet risk management rather than just the short-term benefits. Um, for you to have a long-term effect of your fleet risk management program, it's better that you use a phased approach. So it's not just a every three years they have a driver training program or in-car training or whatever, but every month there is some reminder, there is some intervention, there is something that engages them on the uh, issue of driving safely. It's also important that objective measures are used. If you're wanting to show that your intervention is improving safety, then the outcome measure should be crashes. There are other measures, self-report, uh, some subjective assessments, as the one I mentioned earlier, an assessment drive. But actually, to have some hard, tangible evidence that your intervention has led to an improvement in crash claims cost or fewer offences or fewer um, telematics exception reports um, or better performance, then it's a much more convincing argument for your senior managers to actually uh, roll on with that intervention and continue with the program. Then, of course, once you've uh, undertaken your uh, study, the other key question is what kind of analyses should be performed? And it's really important to have significance testing here because often I notice that uh, fleet companies will use bar charts and, and numbers and frequencies and, and percentages and so on. But actually, when you put that data into a statistical test, it shows that it really is just a random finding. It's, it's not important from a statistical or significant point of view. So analysis is an important uh, component of your intervention evaluation. So just to conclude then, monitor your data prior to any intervention, decide what your objective data monitoring should be preferably. Allocate your fleet drivers randomly to the intervention and the control group. Monitor the effects over a period of time, not just a short period of time, and compare your effectiveness of the intervention across the groups using significance testing. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Lisa. And we'll now be going to Steve Harris from Anglian Water, and thank you very much. Hi, and welcome to the VR programme that Anglian Water and its partners have developed over the past 12 to 18 months. As a business, we're looking at better ways to utilise technology and have recently teamed up with Edge VR, who are part of the education group. They deliver workshops around the world using mobile VR link network, which is capable of accommodating up to 35 users simultaneously. The real beauty of this is the unique scoring platform, which will enable us to tailor our physical training based on the scores outputted from each given scenario. There are many applications in the VR industry where VR is used. We decided to go with Samsung Gear VR as it, as it was the best option to deliver our training. This option is completely remote and wireless, which enables us to take the kit with us on site or to remote locations if needed. No internet connection is required and the ease of use supersedes the other platforms where a high-end powered computer is needed. Staying safe is the most important thing we do, but why stop there? Being comfortable, healthy or happy is a complex combination of your physical, mental and social health factors. At Anglian Water, we care about your well-being and through a series of campaigns and activities aimed to improve our employees' health and well-being, we do all we can to ensure you can be the best you can be at home and at work. The driver safety scenario is a true pioneer in the terms of using and innovation to engage our employees. There are also huge cost savings in delivering our training this way. What we would ideally like to do as a business is put everyone on a safe driving course, but in the real world it would not be possible to have training this way. 
Obviously, we have 3,000 plus drivers to put on the course, but now with the VR platform, it is now a possibility as we can deliver this in-house with the confidence of making a difference. When you first open the application, you'll be given a choice of options. The first part will be the vehicle inspection and onto the 360 observational driving. After these are done, we will look at adding the crash test experience footage of all the driver incidents. To use this, we are working with Leicestershire Fire, who have already produced a 360 video of a crash incident. You will also see the other various modules we are working on. These range from safe digging to working at height. In this training exercise, the participant will be given the task of a vehicle inspection. They will be required to examine the vehicle for general road safety, and the vehicle will be the same as the current fleet vans being used. The software has been developed where we can simply add more defects to be identified or swap the vehicle to a different type. They'll be scored on how many items they correct, get correct, which ranges from the tire depth to the fluids in the vehicle. This is a screenshot of how the application will look. You can see on the warm-up page who has completed the task and how many users are in the session. All of this will be controlled by a central device at any given location. When everyone has done the warm-up session, they will go onto the inspection piece and then onto the 360 driver engagement scenario. As we are working with driver metrics, it would be great to see a tangible result both before and after completing the VR workshops. We are currently in the process of getting this work roster approved, as it's important we have all the right people involved. All the driving scenarios done by a qualified driving instructor, and we have had guidance from various industry professionals. This task will actually put the driver in the shoes of another driver, and the employer will be required to carry out a sequence of observational tasks while travelling along a busy route such as spotting hazards, judging speeds, identifying street signs, and so forth. This task is designed to work alongside a safe driving officer. The overall idea would be to see how well the employees score before and after the training has been completed. This scenario here shows you the different types of locations that test driving will be done. We will look to add to this module as the program increases in size. As you can see on the observational driving, all they have to do is look around to identify the hazards. We have to make it simple to use, and moving forward, we'll be using the retina recognition, where this will track how many times they have checked their mirrors, but also having a mobile phone light up in the center console, where we can see how many seconds they took their eyes off the road to look at the phone. The Angling Water Life program is all about you creating a happier, healthier, and safer place to live. We want everyone to take the time to consider what will happen to us, and the responsibility to be healthier, happier, and safer. This is to create the culture that is driven by the values rather than reacting to circumstance. Life looks at relationships, how we can build in them, our quality of speech, and how we look after ourselves and our colleagues. We can question our perceptions and believe so much more. If you'd like to have any more information, feel free to let me know. I've also completed an interview with Safer Highways UK, talking about the advantages of these technologies within the industry. I will also be at Fleet Live, so pop over and have a demo. The end goal for AW and its partners is to fully engage our teams with a completely remote mobile network where we plan to enhance training and complement the existing platforms being used. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. So we'll now go into the Q&A session. So Lisa, can you hear me okay? Yes. Brilliant. Um, so we've had a question come in for you um, during your presentation specifically. Um, so it's been pointed out by trainers within the industry that many companies don't utilise the data received from telematics. The driving issues are hardly ever reviewed individually. Do you know why this isn't changing? Yeah, it's um, something that's really quite disappointing because there are so much information that telematics can provide and would be very useful to be able to evaluate the benefits of, of interventions. And really, I guess it's a question of making sure that the data that telematics is providing is actually um, easy to manipulate and easy to monitor because some of the systems I've seen really overwhelm fleet managers and, and they don't really know where to start. I think some of the better ones are where you know, it's very simple, they're just key components are monitored, like harsh braking, for example, and then you've got a score and then you can simply look at a before and after compared with the control group. Brilliant, thank you very much for that. Okay, we've got a question in um, specifically for yours. What would you consider the key skills that can demonstrate driver competency and the development of an unconscious competence? The key skills, I, I feel, that um, are related to some of the common problems that we see on the road today, and that is around space management. I feel that um, um, most drivers misjudge the amount of space they, um, they need or can
can create because that's the other difficulty as a core competency in driving is that drivers feel that if they leave other um, space, then their perception is that someone else is going to use that space. And I find that um, that is one of the key competencies that we're trying to develop in everyday training. Um, and that can often be driven by a driver uh, running late, wanting to follow too close, and just a lack of concentration because the underpinning skill that every driver needs to drive well is concentration. The other aspects of dealing with traffic management will follow if you've got good concentration skills. Can I just reply to something that uh, Lisa just mentioned a moment ago about telematics that um, we at DriveTech are doing various case studies at the moment and we really do embrace the use of telematics and um, the value that that can have in tending to um, filter drivers that require an on-training intervention. And another study that I'm personally doing with a company at the moment is we've looked at um, a RAG system whereby we've trained their drivers and brought them probably from the red area into the green. And now what we're doing, we're monitoring the long-term effectiveness of this. Um, and whilst we're seeing um, a gradual drop-off, it is only very slight. So we absolutely support telematics and training on the back of telematics. And as I say, measuring the longevity of the success of that. Kevin Isaacson, our national training manager, is with me. I don't know if you've got anything else to add on the core competencies of uh, driving, Kevin. Well, actually thinking about attitude, behaviour and competencies, I do know that the only thing I want to add on the back of it is the, the comment that was made throughout the presentation that they can come in any order. Yes. I think that was the key thing that for me, just just listening to that recorded session, is that we, we do a lot of work with people who are very highly competent. But um, yeah, there are some massive issues within their attitudes or behaviours. And I, I'm sure Lisa could even comment on this, immediate behaviours linked to emotions and that whole side of it. And um, we, we do quite a lot of work in that kind of area. Competencies seem to be... Yeah, I, I think everyone would agree are quite easily trainable, but there's the attitudes and the behaviours that really need to be tackled. Absolutely. Sarah? I'm just going to see whether Lisa can hear us, just to uh, get a response to that, if you can. Yes, I can hear. And absolutely, the way in which people think, the way in which people feel is going to disrupt their skills and, uh, mm -hmm. and their competence, as you're referring to it. So, so if people are feeling angry, uh, it doesn't matter how good their skills are, it's going to degrade their performance and similarly you know if they're feeling tired or you know if they're if they're feeling anxious all these kind of emotional contexts in which they're driving will interfere with the with the skills performance we fully agree lisa yeah brilliant thank you very much okay. hi lisa is it okay if i ask you another question yes please go ahead so when evaluating driver training interventions, are there any statistical warning signs other than the increased number of crashes that fleet managers should look out for? And when you've um, subjected your data to statistical analysis, the first thing that you should do is clean the data to make sure there's no outliers uh, because you can get some random spikes in the data that need to be taken care of. So that's a kind of a statistical factor to be aware of. But um, I'm not really quite sure where the question is heading, uh, other than making sure that, uh, that that your data is appropriately measured and yeah. analysis is reliable. Mm -hmm. No, that's brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Lisa. So we'll go back to Colin and Keith as well. Hi, hi um, Sarah. Hello. And just another question for you. How would you recommend fleet managers encourage their drivers to continue utilising the self-development plan and accompanying the tools after the training period complete? If you can encourage a driver to um, log journey events, it, th this needn't be a disclosure to their manager. But um, one of the ways I try to self-develop myself is that none of us drive perfectly on every journey. So my journey home tonight, just a moment's reflection on uh, what went well, what didn't go so well. And if there was an event, then trying to analyze how I could prevent that event um, happening in the future. I must admit I don't actually log it, but um, if um, 
that encouraging someone to just sit, the same as we would do on any training intervention. You would ask someone to reflect on a journey and just um, analyze their own performance and, and encourage them to try to analyze how you could pr protect yourself from that event happening again in the future. That is that is the best solution that I, c I could offer is encouraging a um, personal journey log of what um, of, of each event. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Becky. I'm just going to see whether we can get back in contact with Fernanda. Brilliant. Um, so what do you consider to be the single most important message to communicate with drivers and riders to raise awareness about both pedestrians and cyclists? Uh, first of all, the street is the, of everywhere. Um, we must care about the people that we are in front, in front of us. And I think it's a, it's a question of uh, just to take care and to of, of attitude and skill as well, as the, the, the other the speaker said about. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Hi, David. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Brilliant. Uh, so do you think that the duplication of electronic systems, manual systems within new vehicles, to reduce the impact of an electrical failure has increased the level of driver distraction within those vehicles? I don't think so, no. What One of the key questions that we, we have to address, particularly with the moves towards higher automation, if, if you like, yes. there's, there's a human factor issue, so we, we have to make sure that the uh, human machine interface is, is something that isn't distracting and, and isn't confusing and uh, but I think there's an important message there which is there there is a European statement of principles on human machine interface design in vehicles but but that was written probably about 15 to 20 years ago so it will probably be in, interesting to see whether that needs any any update for for automation I, th I think probably one of the key issues is around the handover between level three systems and and manual driving. I think the other question from a more technical point of view is that one of the things that we have to do in designing vehicles under the hood, so to speak, is, is to make sure that they, they are sufficiently reliable and these systems have a, a certain level of continuing to operate in, in the presence of failures, particularly when, when the vehicle's in, in a highly automated state. That's brilliant. Um, and just one further question, David, before we go um, and ask Steve. Do you think that automated technology will have an impact on the safety of the grey fleet? Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, in in that case, you're you're very much in the hands of the the extent to which these automated features penetrate in, into the market. So, I think if if you look at the market penetration, we'll we'll you'll see a number of these features starting to become standard in, in more and more new vehicles, but clearly it, it, it is going to take time for, for these to sort of trickle down to, to maybe sort of old, older vehicles, as, as it were. But generally speaking, studies that have been conducted um, say that you sort of reach a critical mass above which a certain penetration of technology into the market gives gives an overall benefit, even if not every vehicle's fitted with it. But I think that there is an important question here about about the sort of integration and penetration of, of the market and also, you know, the mix between automated vehicles and, and non-automated vehicles. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Steve, and we've got a question for you. If you can just confirm that you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you now. Brilliant. Fabulous news. So we've got two questions for you, Steve. So I'll just start with the first one. Do you think that introducing VR technology to the training process could have different effects on younger and older drivers, or do you think there are any specific drivers you would identify as having trouble adapting to the technology? Um, it's something we thought about very a long for a long time when we first started the project a year ago, and I actually rolled out a demo trial pilot to about 200 people, um, varied from the age of 17 all the way up to the age of 60 plus. And what we found was that there was exactly the same amount of engagement and enthusiasm for people wanting to use it and utilize it. It's just more about the engagement piece for us because everything we do as a business is is much the same. And then if we can just use this to utilize that missing gap we have from the driver metrics profile to the one-on-one -on -one training to the PowerPoint, it just enhances the, the learning modules for each individual person. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much for that. And the second question is, will you be utilizing driver and manager feedback to develop updates for the VR system? And how will you be using that feedback? 
Well, it's going to be, it's not so much more getting the feedback from the drivers utilising the software and the platform. What it's going to be is the more data we can pull out of it and extract it. Because at the minute, we can pull out quite a lot of data combined with our driver metrics profile that we do. But as technology advances, we can, for example, we can have a mobile phone flash up on the dashboard. And if your eyes look down to look at it, we can capture that data of how many times they're distracted in the vehicle. So obviously the problem is, like, like someone mentioned recently, to, if you've got a big fleet, it will cost upwards of a million pounds to put everyone on a driving course. And obviously doing it in this platform, we can take it down to about 30K to do the whole industry. Um, so again, the cost savings are huge, but the technology, we're already advancing with the technology to try and build on the platform that's already designed. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay, Jonathan? Yeah, fine. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, so from your presentation, if there was um, one key message which you could only kind of reach out to drivers about, what would that one key message be? I think I might start by just supporting what Lisa said earlier, though. Just if, if there was yeah. one key message from our whole presentation, it would be that telematics completely agree. It's only really useful if people are just looking at the very key information they need. Um, and indeed, you know, we've been in the market for a long time and looking at the way that we've evolved our solution over the years, it's very much in mind with the fact that our customers don't have people that they employ specifically just to sit there and trawl through lots of data every day. It's all about presenting that key information that's actually going to be used. Um, and hopefully that came across in my presentation, but you know, Lisa absolutely you know, agree with her ethos on it. 100%. Um, so that, that's probably the key message from the presentation. In terms of the driver, the driver message itself, I think you know there's a lot said about telematics and technology in general when it comes to drivers, um, and it's quite an old discussion. And I think it's quite a tired discussion around um, the fact that it's a, seen as a big brother system. You know the reality is that if people are implementing a solution from a safety perspective. That's that's really the key. So you know we don't we don't go out and try and sell to people a safety solution unless they you know are looking to actually have a safety culture driven business themselves because you know otherwise it of course in you know in the wrong hands it can be a big brother thing if there's no safety drive organisationally then technology is just an extra piece of kit in the cab that's that's sitting there and potentially recording events and you know, not being used. So the whole point is, you know, we would only recommend a telematic safety solution if the organisation is really bought into the concept that they have, they want to look after safety culturally, they believe that there's an issue that they want to resolve in their organisation. And of course, then the driver does become the VIP. And, you know, in that situation, we, we can propose the right solutions to, to match the needs of the organisation. But, you know, 100%, it's there to protect the driver. It's there to make sure the driver can go home safely to their families every day. It's not there to, you know, keep an eye on them for some, you know, extraneous reason. It's, it's purely around trying to benefit the whole organisation from a safety perspective. Sorry, that wasn't very um, that wasn't very concise, but that was the no, key. That was a very detailed answer. And we've um, appreciated that. That was great. Thank you, um, especially when you're on the spot. So obviously, the telematics, the data which you can um, get from telematics is so vast now. Are there key indicators of risky behaviour that you feel fleet managers should specifically look for or track in their vehicle data? Yeah, for sure. I, you know, I think it's always important to understand you know, a company's composition first. So, you know, you spoke about grey fleets before, for example. So, yeah. you know, we, from our experience, we, we provide solutions for all different types of fleets, shapes and sizes, cultures, um, and different industry types as well, for example. So we always look at the circumstances and scenarios of an organisation. The, the behaviours themselves, you know, they do tend to be the classic braking, acceleration, speeding, um, behaviors but you know some organizations and it depends on you know it depends on their composition they like to you know monitor things like seat belt usage for instance and they add that into the you know the safety scoring some people you know we we also have got involved in solutions for kind of preemptive um, distraction and fatigue now so that's a you know that's really a coming 
Um, you know, coming from the angle that mobile phone usage in the vehicle is a major issue. You know, we're all addicted to mobile phones. You know, some of us admit it and some of us don't, but you know, we're all addicted to mobile mm -hmm. phones, and yeah. it's a huge temptation for drivers to, you know, if if something's beeping at them or flashing, then they might well take a look at it. So, you know, that's that's an issue that telematics and you know, again the whole safety drive of an organisation can tackle together. Fatigue is a major issue. Everyone wants to to get from A to B, to make more journeys, to be more productive. Um, so fatigue, you know, is another measure. So really you've got, you know, the classic driving behaviors, if you like, but then it's it's almost the driving states then as well, as well as behaviors. So, you know, how, you know, how is the driver on that particular day? You know, are they, um, are they tired? Are they, you know, concentrating? It's not just then the vehicular style behaviors. We're, we're starting to get into the real, um, you know, the behavioural stuff that extends beyond, you know, which pedals they're pressing the vehicle. So, you know, I think it's going more in that, more and more in that direction. Again, technology is, is kind of the second step. The first step is really understanding what's happening in a company and then being able to then select the right behaviours to monitor. And again, you know, Lisa said it, it should be concentrated on maybe two or three key things. Um, and it should, you know, it should be kept high level and, you know, we shouldn't go too much into into the whole big brother thing it's it's really about those core safety behaviors first brilliant thank you very much for that detailed answer jonathan we're going to wrap up there thank you very much for joining us here today we've got a full program of events taking place throughout 2018 and i'd also like to take this opportunity to remind you to enter our fleet safety awards and um, they take place on the 11th of october in birmingham um, the awards recognise the achievements of those working to help reduce the number of road crashes involving outwork drivers and break welcomes awards entries from organisations within any size or type of fleet, as well as from companies that provide road safety products or services to fleets. The deadline for applications is Friday the 15th of June and you can find out more by visiting fleetsafetyawards.com. Please visit our Brick professional website for more information or you can give us an email professional at brick.org.uk. That just leaves me to say thank you very much to today's speakers and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.